Hi everyone, thank you for joining our talk, a Solaris Production Retrospective. We are very excited to be here on behalf of Arx Anima and SideFX to explore with you our USD Solaris pipeline, the choices we faced and lessons we learned while producing our latest movie. My name is Ben Lutz and together with Hannes Reindl, we are the senior members of the Arx Anima pipeline team. Arx Anima is an award-winning studio based in the heart of Europe in the city of Vienna in Austria. We are a service work company composed of multiple departments specialized in different areas. Longform takes on bigger projects such as animated feature films and TV series. Special Format is dedicated to advertisement and projects that include our very own motion capture. The VFX department focuses on live action shows. And the Intellectual Property department is focused on creating new IPs. Now let's have a look at our show reel. So you're a tough guy, like you really rough guy Just can't get enough guy, just always so puff guy I'm that bad type, make your mama sad type Make your girlfriend mad type, mess it with your dad type I'm the bad guy Duh Our long-form team is currently in between projects and that's a perfect moment for us to focus our resources in solidifying our USD Solaris knowledge and bring it to the next level for the upcoming projects. In this presentation, while I will focus more on the theoretical topics, Hannes will provide you practical examples of our implementation. In this first part, I will go over our process designing a USD pipeline from scratch. Here we'll share a bit about the various choices we faced, some of the challenges and the decisions we came to in the end. For us, what made a really big difference was to consider the USD aspect of designing elements first and only once we have everything defined, then going into LOPs and building things up there. Using this process, we first consider the hierarchy and also the various features and goals we have in this specific project which then informs our USD composition arcs. And finally, with everything done, only then we go into LOPs and have a much simpler time implementing things there. We will demonstrate this process by specifically looking at the setup of individual assets, but the same principles also apply when building up shots, sets, or any other thing in USD and LOPs. The first element we consider when building up an asset is the hierarchy. This will almost always be geometry and materials, but sometimes might include also effects, volumes, light, etc. Unlike some other packages in USD, materials also are basically elements that live within the asset root and would usually be grouped underneath a materials prim. When it comes to assets in USD, the important aspect is the single root primitive that will be then used to load the asset into another shot or set, for example. This root primitive will have to contain everything that will be needed in the shot or set and will also be defined as the default primitive so when loading in the asset it doesn't have to be specified which primitive to load. Regarding naming, it doesn't matter what the root primitive is called because when it is referenced the name will be overwritten when loading it into the scene anyway. At this stage we also considered an approach which includes an additional group beneath the root group, which could allow for better resource use when dealing with variants, but we ended up not using the extra group to keep the hierarchy simple, and with only a limited amount of variants, performance was not going to be an issue. With the hierarchy defined, 
it is time to look at the overall structure. Now the big question is sublayer or reference when loading in data. This was primarily about how to load in the geometry. One of the guiding principles we use from the USD documentation is if it satisfies your requirements, prefer sublaying over referencing. The main aspects of the layer that concerned us here were the fact that it would load everything as it is and that it will be the strongest of the composition arcs. Loading everything as is makes sense for us, so in the end the main concern was simply about strength ordering. This came down to considering if it was possible to override what we need later with variants. Since we designed our asset workflow in a way that everything would be saved out again from Houdini, this means in case of any conflict we could always adjust the opinions in the affected layer, so we ended up choosing layers for everything. The other reason for choosing sublayers is that it is the simplest composition arc and every part is just layered on top of the next. Now we come to one of the biggest defining factors of any asset in USD, variants. In this production we use them mainly for materials, also level of detail, sub D and some optional effects. And the common aspect for all those elements was how to set up the asset that we could override the opinions with variants where we needed to. When it comes to variants and strength, there are basically two options to consider. Either remove everything from the local layer that we intend to override with a variant, or if this is not possible, use a reference instead of sublayer, so variants become stronger and we can override what we need to. For our choice of having everything in a layer, this then simply meant that anything to be overwritten would have to be removed or not written out there in the first place. When it comes to variants, initially it seems tempting to try to only override the minimal amount of attributes needed, but sometimes we found it easier to simply write out a bit more. For example, for material variations, simply writing out all the materials and assignments for each variant where the overhead is not too big and making the setup in LOPS a bit simpler in the end. Inherits turned out to be one of the most useful composition arcs for us in this production, and we actually kept adding more inherits during the production because they proved to be so flexible and useful. Our main use cases for inherits are a default class for the asset, and furthermore for each kind of shader, and some for categories like, for example, all trees would have one common category. The main use for us was to simply overwrite every asset in a shot with, for example, a different shader, or a lot of times to update all shaders of a certain type with a new version or certain parameters. Well, overriding every element of a shot could also be achieved by simply writing the attribute on every asset in the shot. It is not possible to simply override attributes within an instance. So if you want to keep the instancing alive, inherits are the way to go to allow us to override opinions within the asset and still have instancing working. Finally, the last composition arc we used in our assets are payloads. And when it comes to payloads, the question we asked ourselves at the beginning was, will we need them? When we started building up the asset pipeline in USD, we didn't know how big the overall shots would be and how USD would handle it. So we decided to have payloads in there as a just in case kind of approach. The way we implemented it was following the Pixar asset structure where it is part of the asset itself, meaning that the file we reference then itself will payload the actual contents of the asset. So from the outside, it is treated just as a normal reference when it is loaded into a set or a shot. And on the inside, it comes with the additional payload composition arc. For us, it turned out that we actually didn't really need payloads that much. For most of the scenes, it was pretty quick to load them from a pure USD point of view. Processing things with just pure Python was fast, even with all the assets loaded. And in the end, what made a much bigger difference was having good proxies for the viewport to keep things nice and interactive.
Also, there are still alternatives to deal with heavy scenes, like deactivating parts of the scene graph before even activating the viewport or cooking things. And also, the populate all primitives in viewport option allows to selectively load things in Solaris. Once the scenes we have to deal with in USD are much bigger, we will probably re-evaluate payloads again. And with this, we now are ready to define our final asset structure where we have the main asset USD file that then payloads the payload file. And this payload file is the one that actually loads in all the content via sublayers, one sublayer for each main step, one for the geometry, one for the materials, optionally extra for proxy and effects. Within the geometry USD file, it can contain variants, for example, for level of detail and subdivision, and with the material, we would have variants for shading, etc. Now that we have defined our asset in USD, it is finally time to build it up in LOPS. The first choice we're faced with is load layer for editing or sublayer when it comes to bring in the data, because in our setup we want to write out everything again in case of modifications, the load layer node is the choice for us. Following the load layer will be a series of modifications and anything we want to do in LOPS. And at the end, with a configure layer, we will define the safe path of that layer and also start a new layer to write everything following that to the next layer in the asset. While some nodes like load layer or subcreate nodes can specify the safe path directly, usually we found it nicer to have an explicit configure layer also with the start new layer option to show how everything will be saved out from the lob node graph. To add our payload arc, we just use the reference node with everything connected to the second multi input and the mode set to payload from that input. In the end, a ROP USD node will write out the main asset file that is then used to be referenced into sets or shots, etc. When it comes to building up things in lobs, like everywhere else in Houdini, there are lots of alternatives. We could have achieved the same results by instead using the merge node and putting all the various layers of the asset in there, or by instead of going with the configure layer approach, using the sub layer to achieve the same result. One of the main differences between these approaches is whether or not data is available. For example, the material library connected to the sub layer or merge node does not have the geometry available when designing something in there. Therefore, it is necessary to view the supply or merge node to actually see the composed result. Depending on the scene, this can be beneficial in some cases when it is useful to view things independently, but can also lead to some performance issues when switching between big lob graphs when we are dealing with choosing the right kind of node setup, in most cases we will choose the linear one layer of the other with the configure layer approach, when there is no other reason to use a different one. When it comes to building more complex setups in LOPS, one thing we are faced with is the way layers are handled in Solaris, especially the implicit layers. Gaining a better understanding of how it works and what will be written where made things a lot smoother for us to work with LOPS. The most useful element in Houdini to figure out where everything goes is the scene graph layers panel. In there, we can see while working on it where something would be written to and how the layers would look like and if there are any kind of problems already occurring. Besides that, it is also useful to keep an eye on the layer count in the node tree the colors for layers and potential warnings, usually about unconfigured layer safe paths. One thing that can make a difference in LOPS is the order of nodes. Even though in the viewport the result will look the same and the composed USD stage will also show no difference, it makes a difference when it comes to the implicit layers. In this example we see here, we just have three nodes and we see with each node the layer count increases. Now, if we check in the scene graph layers panel, we see that we have an implicit layer from the reference 
then a sub layer set to don't save and another implicit layer when you want to save out those nodes with a robbed node we will be presented with an error because of an automatically created save path now whenever we come across a case such as this there are two simple solutions the first option is simply to change the order of nodes in the graph resulting in a different order of implicit layers allowing everything to be saved out correctly like we see here the other alternative is to adjust the parameters on the sublayer node here by either choosing to disable edit root layer thereby making the sublayer not part of the root layers but a sublayer of the active layer or changing in the composition part the sublayer position to make sure the sublayer doesn't get put in between implicit layers the same kind of approach when building up assets also made it very convenient to build up all the other lob node setups we needed for things like effects, shots, etc. By simply going about the process from a USD first point of view, then in lobs things are much simpler to design when only considering the lob specific aspects of the setup. During the course of this production, we were also faced with a few things we discovered later, and it turned out to be pretty straightforward to update assets later on and add things like more inherits or even level of detail to the geometry layer. As long as assets are designed in a consistent manner, it is no big deal to add some features or change some things later we found. And finally, while there are lots of options and these presented are the ones we chose, it seemed a lot of the alternatives would have worked out just fine too. Because in the end, USD is very powerful and allows to almost always find a way to override or fix anything later. And now it is time to look at some more practical examples. And with that, it is over to Hannes. Thank you, Ben. I will continue now with the hands-on part of the talk. We did prepare a HIP file, which we will share with you. And we will show you here how we use Solaris to set up our assets, to set up all the light templates we used, and then finally light the shots and render out the render passes. Since we are sharing those files, we did use assets here from our private collection because we simply cannot share assets from the production. For the presentation, we are setting up three assets. The only difference between those assets is uh, the instancing. The first one is just unpacking the geometry and does not use any instancing at all. The second one is using native instances. So you can see here uh, we have the prototypes and then the instances of those prototypes. And the third one is setting up a point instancer. So again, we have the prototypes and here's the instancer with all the positions and the geometry assignment for the positions. When you check out the prototypes or the geometry in general, uh, you see that we have a hierarchy already. That is done by creating a custom attribute called name USD. So when we check out the geometry spreadsheet in SOPS, we see that on the outside of the packed primitives, we have the name USD attribute on the points. And when we unpack the geometry and check out the primitives, we see that the name USD attribute is there. So this results in Solaris taking the attribute from the point and using it on the X-form and the attribute from the primitive is used on the mesh. The next thing we do is we take care of attributes. So we tended to use Python for this. You can, of course, use the Solaris nodes or VEX, but when we started using Solaris, it was still in beta. And for example, there were not that many VEX commands as there are now. And also we wanted to use the Python API of USD to be able to use the code also outside of Solaris. So we, for example, have some standalone tools preparing assets and those tools also run the same code we uh, have in here. The code itself is very straightforward code you find in the USD documentation. Uh, the first thing we do is that we remove an attribute. So there is the subdivision scheme, which actually is created by the subcreate node. 
so far we couldn't find a way to tell the sub create node to not create this attribute and also we didn't find a solaris node or a vex command which allows us to remove attributes afterwards so in this case for example you have to use the python api and we need to remove this attribute because we want to make a variant which turns on and off subdivisions so if the subdivision is already set here, the variant will not be strong enough. So the opinion of the layer here will always be stronger. So we need to remove the attribute first. The next thing we do is just adding a simple rest position so we can have an AOE for compositing. And the third one is that we set up uh, crypto mats. So the code actually sets up two crypto mats. They're basically the same. One is just a crypto mesh, which is generating one mask per mesh. So this works for just meshes and native instances. And the other one is called crypto stands. That's basically doing the same thing. It's just taking account the point instances. So we'll get one mask per point instance. Next up are the variants now. Variants are very, very powerful concept in USD where you can add a variant to anything in USD. Some things might be more tricky than other things, but in general, most of the stuff you can do in USD or in Solaris can be used as a variant. How do you actually set up a variant in Solaris? That's very simple. There is an add variant node. And all you need to do is uh, on the second input, you add your variants. So whatever you change here will be then part of the variant. In this case, the first variant we set up here, that is the subdivision variant. So you remember we deleted the subdivision scheme here, which makes it now usable for us as a variant down here. And I simply create a variant, turning it off. And here I uh, turning it on. So that's all there is to this subdivision variant. The next one is the shading. This is a simple material library node. So there are simply some materials in there with geometry assignments. And this is a second variant of it. So when we check this out, the first one is called Ice Planet. So that's the color scheme of this set here. And the second one is Space Police. That's just a color scheme of another set but I can already switch through them and it's working fine. For the native instances, there is nothing different to be done. They work exactly the same. For the point instance, we do need to address the materials in a little bit of a different way. Because if you check out the point instancer, you do not have instances listed here anymore. You have only a list of the points but nothing is here. So what you can do is you can select point instances uh, individually in the viewport. This will then result in a rim pattern like this, where you just have the number of the point instance in the bracket here. And what we do here is that we first assign a material to the point instancer. That's, this is just one plastic material. And in the variant, we use the material variation node which simply writes an attribute onto the point instancer. This node is not exclusive for point instancer. This can be used everywhere. All the node really does is that it writes those primvars down. So in this case, uh, let's see the whole thing. Here I overwrite the base color so you can see every point on the point instancer has now a different value for the base color. And that's what the material variation node does. That's a very, very uh, powerful thing to do because this allows you to assign one shader to your whole scene and then just set different shader values on the geometry. And Karma will just read those values and pass it on to the material at render time. This said, though, there is one thing to be aware of that if you do that and if you would like to overwrite the material in your shot with a different one, let's say you want to make out a wood instead of a plastic shader, you still have those primvars on the meshes, so they are independent from the material. If this is something you do not want, you have to keep in mind that they are still there. So that's an important thing. As it is for variants, here show now only two. In production, we actually used a little bit more. We had obviously the, the subdivision and the material variants. 
But for environments, for example, we had variants depending on if we are interior or exterior. So we had buildings and if we're inside the building, the art director sometimes wanted some trees move a little bit different. So you have a nice view out of the window and so on. And if we're outside of the building, we also had to move some stuff around just to make the scene look nice. One thing that also enabled us if we were inside and we know, for example, there is a wall with no window, we know that all the assets behind that wall, you will never see that from inside of the building. So we could simply deactivate all of them in the variant. Another thing we did was that we had assets with effects. One example is a chimney where there's smoke coming out of the chimney. But it's not always there and these effects were not simulated on a shot basis. It was just smoke puffing up. We added a variant for effects there, which we can simply turn it on and off. And another thing was then the light template, which I come to later, where we did set up different light conditions for environments and we could just then switch between them via variants. The next thing we do is we set up our proxy geometry. In our examples here, we quickly generate proxy geo on the fly. In production, we actually receive the proxy geo along with the actual asset geometry, but it doesn't really matter as long as the geometry is there, which we have here now. And the next thing up here is we configure the primitive. So the proxy geometry is getting the purpose of proxy. The render geometry is getting purpose render and we assigned proxy primitive to it. So USD knows what primitive to switch to. If you look now in the viewport, you still see both geometries. That's a viewport bug currently. You can just click the classes, check render, uncheck render, and now you only see the proxy geometry as you expected. If we click the render button here, we see that the high risk geometry is rendering and everything is fine. If you want to set up the proxies with variants, you can, of course, do that. I would then just set up the proxy before the variants. But for us, that wasn't really something we wanted to do. The only thing we did for proxies was that we baked the material information onto the vertex as vertex color. So we have some semblance on how the colors will look like. The inherits. So inherits are a really cool concept in USD where you can change settings on one primitive and drive a lot of other primitives with this one primitive. So we did use this to access either all assets or a certain amount of assets in the shot with only a few mouse clicks. Good example is that we had inherit primitives, so classes we used for leaves, for example, or for trees and bushes and so on. So, or if you build a city, you can maybe add windows or doors. So you can basically add whatever you want to. In the shot, then you only have to make a change to this one primitive. How we do that is we use a reference node, give it the primitive we want to inherit to. We say, in this case, we inherit from the first input and we tell it to inherit from a primitive, which is the default class. So this primitive does not need to exist now in the stage because we just tell it to inherit from it. And if we click on the scooter prim, we do see that in the metadata, we have now inherit paths and here we have our default class. Last thing to do now is to simply export the asset. So we simply create a ROP node, tell, define the USD file. And in the case of the asset, we also define here the default primitive. So the default primitive needs to be there because we reference the assets into the shot and references only bring in one primitive. This, of course, needs to be defined. And in this case, it's just a top primitive here uh, on our asset. That's the end of the asset part. So this is how we managed our assets. This is how every asset in the whole movie was set up, every prop, character, and environment. And we were able to, well, manage it pretty good with this setup. Let's talk about the light templates now. For the sake of the demonstration, we just bring in a simple grid. And it doesn't really matter what we bring in here, to be honest, because what's important is what's going on in the variants down here and how many assets or how much stuff you actually load 
doesn't really affect it too much. So for the variants, the first thing we do is a layer break. This is very important. So we ensure that whatever happens here is handled as an over and we don't actually save out stuff from the environment we bring in into the variant. Then the next thing is uh, we create a primitive called config. I will come to this one in a second. And here we actually set up now the variants. I just made a simple setup with a sunlight for a day condition and a sunlight for a dawn condition. The two null nodes here are only to make my life a little bit easier and I don't need to write the variant names in every single variant node down here. The variant nodes might be a little bit strange since we only set up one light variant and we have multiple nodes here. We do need to add this variant to every single node in the root to ensure the artist can affect anything they need to affect. This way of doing it also means that you can't not really dynamically just add uh, stuff to the root in your shot, which should also be affected by the light template. So if you have a shot and you say, I need to make a new primitive on the root, which should also take into account what the light template is changing, you also need to go back to the light template and add this stuff there. The config prim. I mentioned before also gets this light template and this primitive is here to actually set the template so every other thing which does exist in the root will just inherit from this config this way we just make it simple to change the light variation on one primitive instead of nine primitives or so what we had in the end the inherits themselves are set up with python this time because we just go into the root get all the root nodes and everything of type X from there will get the inherit from the config. So to demonstrate how this works now is we just add a set variant node here, tell it to use the config node, and then we say we want to affect the light set and we can change here. So you see the light primitive now is also set to dawn, even though I am changing it on the config primitive. So this way, it's very, very easy to change the lighting template on the entire shot, even though it affects multiple primitives. The lighting template itself, once it was approved, we actually did put the information on which variants to exist or which light conditions to exist. We did put this information into Shotgun and we could then simply say this shot is using this light condition, this shot is using this light condition and the script which did set up the shot files would put this information then already into the USD file and set the variant there. In the end, the only thing left is again to save out the USD file. There is nothing special going on here. It's just a simple rod node defining a path to the USD file and that's it. Before we can start lighting the shot, I have to actually talk a little bit about the scene file. So the scene file is a concept we took from Pixar and it's basically just a one USD file which is loading one layer per department and all the departments are working in their own layer. We have here the layout layer. Um, layout is referencing in all the assets. They are setting up the shot camera and they're also animating the shot camera most of the time. The next department is then animation. They load in the scene file. They work in the animation layer. And after they are finished, we have animation and this is coming back to the scene file. In our production, we also had FX. So before lighting, the FX layer was loaded in uh, and it's the same concept, fx is loading in the scene file, they work in the fx layer, and in the end, the fx layer gets loaded back into the scene file. And same deal with lighting. They load the scene file, do their stuff in the lighting layer, and that's got loaded back. To say here is this a Solaris setup you see here, this is something this does not exist in our pipeline because the scene file was handled fully automated. So... What we got is that we got caches from other studios. We just prepared the USD files and we then just loaded them into the scene file. This was just a standalone Python script, which was using the USD API. And this is how we handled this part. Let's talk about lighting. 
As mentioned before, every department will load in the scene file. So we do this here. And this already can bring now uh, one problem, or it's actually a little bit of a paradox thing. The scene file already contains the department layer. So our scene file is already loading a lighting layer. Currently, it doesn't really matter because the lighting layer would be an empty USD file. But imagine you do now version 2, version 3, whatever, everything after version 1 will load in already lighting information, which you actually don't want because you do want that the nodes in Solaris will build up your layer. So what we do for that is we use a configure stage node and we set this lighting layer to mute. This tells Solaris that whenever this USD file is loaded, it should unload it and basically remove it from the memory. There's one thing I noticed while setting up this presentation. If you look here at the scene graphs panel, dollar $hip returns on Windows a capital drive letter, while for some reason in USD lower case drive letters are saved. So this expression will actually, in this case, not work. So what we have to do is write in the full path with the lowercase drive letter. I'm not sure if that's actually a Houdini bug or if that's coming from USD. I only know it has to do with Windows. We did not have this issue on Linux. Basically, this is the workaround for now. Now that we discussed how to solve the issue, let's get back to our main topic. We have muted now the original lighting layer and we can start working on the actual lighting layer. First thing we do is a layer break to ensure that whatever we do in our layer is saved as an over and we do not save information coming in a second time in our layer then. Next up is the variant sets. So in the presentation here, I only set the subdiv here uh, in production. At this point, we would set the interior exterior on the environment. We would set the FX variant on the assets. We would set different shading variants on the assets. So that's all handled here at this stage. Then we set up the class primitives we use for the global overrides. In our case here, it's only the default class, which we'll use later on. And then we set some more attributes. Also here, it's only a new crypto mat called crypto asset. And this is only generating one mask uh, for each asset. In the end, we save out the layer here. So we are in the lighting layer, but every department for us did also layer their department. One thought was that when we layer the departments, we could actually reuse certain layers from one shot in another shot. And the other thing is that it's actually easier to debug stuff in case something went wrong, some problem is there. You can just open a single USD file instead of the whole shot. After the shot is configured, we did load in the render settings. In the presentation here, I simply use a Karma node. In production, this was actually a sublayer node pointing to a USD file, and this USD file already contained predefined render settings, which we found work uh, pretty well for our movie. Also, all the AOVs we agreed on uh, to be used in our movie. So for the artist, they already got a predefined set of settings for the renderer, and all the AOVs were prepared for them. We still save out this layer into the render settings layer because most of the time they had to tweak uh, a little bit the settings on a shot basis. Now we can move on to the lighting. So first thing we do is we load our light template and then we set the light condition. In this case, I used day. Here, the artist will then either edit lights coming in from the light template, they will add new lights for the characters or for whatever they need. So all the lighting for the shot will now take place here. Also, all the light linking, basically everything related to lighting is happening here. After all the lights are settled, we move on to the light path expressions. Here, just use the render bar node. I just set up two light path expressions, sun and rim, and I create a diffuse and reflection AOV for both of them. 
in production, this did uh, not happen this way. We have an HDA which is looking into the stage and is searching for lights with light path expressions. And if it finds a light path expression on a light, it will simply set up the uh, render bar for this light for the artist. After that, we once again save out the light layer. This is basically the lighting part of the shot done. At this point, we are almost done with the lighting layer. There are just two more steps. Uh, one of those two steps I did not include into this demonstration here. That was just a layer called edit where we basically did hide assets, we did move assets, we just uh, tiny changes to the scene required to make the shot work. Uh, they did all go into this layer, but it's all pretty basic stuff there. So there's not really anything special to show. The materials layer I added here because I will set up an ambient occlusion pass and the ambient occlusion material is in there. This is also how we handled that in production that any kind of special uh, material we need to for the render passes uh, goes in there. The artists themselves, they usually did not have to do a lot with the materials layer since all the assets were fully shaded and all the variations of shading did actually come with variants so there was minor tweaks sometimes here and there but most of the time the material layer was pretty slim of course we save it out to the material layer and then we are done uh, setting up the lighting layer so this will be now saved uh, into the lighting usd file you realize the render passes are not part of the lighting layer and we will talk about this now So for the render passes, we said we want to use our uh, own concept for that. Instead of using the takes that come with Houdini, the only simple reason for that is that we said we want to stay in pure USD and the concept should be applicable any anywhere. And that's why we said, okay, uh, let's come up with our own concept for render passes since uh, USD doesn't really have a concept for that. The first thing we tried on that is that we said, okay, let's just make a variant out of the light layer, which will then be the pass. But we did run into uh, several issues there because of opinions. So liver piece, the highest priority loop, uh, opinion actually is the layer and the, the variant is actually the third level there, which means that we could not set up everything we want to in a variant for the render parts, which was bad since the artists, they needed to change whatever they need to change uh, for the pass to work. So since variants were not an option, we then said, okay, the layer has the uh, highest priority opinion. So we make the render pass a layer. Doing that, the first thing we do for the passes is making a layer break to again, avoid that anything that comes before is actually saved in our layer or in our pass. And only the things we put into our pass are saved as overs and uh, nothing else. To set up a pass now, so I have here assets, asset space, asset occlusion, floor, and floor occlusion. So the first uh, pass uh, assets, I only wanted to render my three assets there and the floor or the environment will become its own pass then. So we always separated characters and props from the environment. Uh, oftentimes we could just render, for example, the environment in one frame if it wasn't a moving camera. And that also saved a lot of render time. How we do that is the first thing we edit our render product and decide which render vars we want to render in that pass. So those are basically the AOVs, the render vars. We tell it uh, where the output file, our XR files will be saved to. And the next thing is just, I set my environment to phantom. So here's minus primary. When you click here in the render geometry settings node, you can click here and you have a few presets and uh, phantom is minus primary. What that means is basically the primary rays will not contribute to the image. Only the secondary rays which hit this object will contribute to the image. Since we are here now, we can render it and we see, okay, we only have our assets. And down here I see I all I have all my AOVs. So there's crypto mesh and crypto stands. Those are the two crypto mats we did set up on the asset earlier. And here's Crypto Asset, which we did set up in the lighting layer earlier. 
then here is direct diffuse, direct loss reflection. So basically, I just activated a few AOVs on the Karma node. And down here, the rim diffuse, rim reflection, then sun diffuse and sun reflection. Those are the uh, light path expressions we did set up earlier. So we see everything is here, everything is working, and the first pass is ready. For the second pass, the only thing I change is that I want to render the color scheme uh, of the Space Police team. So I did the same thing as I did for the Assets pass. Just at the end, I switched the variant to Space Police. And when I render it now, I see, okay, all my uh, shaders changed and I have this different color theme now. Of course, I do have all my AOVs. They just work perfectly fine. This is another example to demonstrate how powerful variants are because when you set them up in the way you need them, it takes very little effort to change a lot of things in your scene. So variants are a really, really cool way to change things in your scene and manage your scene. Next up is the assets occlusion. So... For this, we will use the occlusion shader we created here. So in the lighting layer, I added this material. And before we actually set up the pass, uh, I want to mention that you could also add the occlusion AOV to the beauty render. For this to happen, you would need to implement the occlusion into all your materials. We didn't do that because we wanted to use the principal shader from Houdini uh, that ships out of the box and occlusion is simply not part of that. So we said, okay, let's make our own uh, occlusion pass because that's simpler to handle then. And the first thing we do for that now is we again add a render products node. We edit the render product and say we want to only render the rest position and the occlusion. And we again define where we save the EXR file. And the next thing we do is that we take advantage now of this default class. Earlier, we did set up the inherits on the assets. So every asset is inheriting from this default class. And here we say now, okay, the materials prim should be deactivated. What this does is, if I click on the render product again, uh, if you look at the scene graph here, you see that uh, all my materials from the assets are there. The moment I deactivate the materials prim, the materials are gone. So you see here they are deactivated. And this will result in the assets now do not have any material bindings anymore. So all the material bindings are set to none now if the material it's bound to is not found. The next thing is then that I sign my own material. So here I say again, on my default class, the geometry prim should get uh, the material occlusion assigned. So when we check out the assets now, geometry, material binding, we see that our occlusion material is now assigned to the material. From now on, all our assets will render with our occlusion material. Here again, uh, the environment is set to phantom. And down here, the render settings need a slight change you remember in the render product, I said uh, render occlusion and uh, render my rest position. So by default, Pixel Oracle looks at the beauty AOV. So uh, there's a C here, that's the beauty AOV. And it looks at this to decide how many samples it needs. Since the beauty AOV is gone, it will just uh, sample against black, which results in no samples. So that doesn't make any sense. That's why I said, okay, please sample against the occlusion AOV here. And therefore, I will get now my samples. When we render it now, we'll see, okay, everything is rendering with the occlusion. That's fine. I have my occlusion AOV. And here I can also switch to my rest AOV. And now we finally see the uh, rest attribute we added to our assets earlier. All of these passes are now set up. They are working. And only the environment is now left and there is nothing really special to it. I do exactly the same thing. I decide which uh, AOVs I want to have. I say, okay, the assets should now be phantom and my environment should render. Doing that, when we render it, we'll see, yeah, perfect. Our environment is here and the assets are only casting shadows now onto the environment. 
And for the blower occlusion pass, we do the same thing as we did for the asset occlusion pass. Just again, the assets are phantom now. And when we render that, we see that our assets are occluding the environment now. This concludes basically the passes. This is how we set up the passes. You can do whatever you want to do. It's just another USD layer where you can change whatever. And all we need to do now is to save out the USD files and render them. So for the rendering part, you might have realized that if we would just say uh, render this USD file here, it will basically result in a black image. The reason is because all this USD file has is basically overrides for our scene file. So what we do is that we provided a script for our artists where they can check and uncheck which passes they want to render. And the script then takes care of saving out all the USD file needed for that pass and then sending on the flight generated USD file into the farm, which layers in the scene file and the USD pass as override. So... I made a short example here to uh, show you uh, how basically the file looks, which we send it into the farm. So here we just load in the scene file, then we load in the assets USD file, and we save out another file, which is then getting rendered in the farm. So this is basically how the whole render process works. If you open up this file yourself and something is not working, you might need to save out some of the USD files, especially here you need the, the template and the assets and that stuff. So make sure to click the save to disk button on the ROP nodes. They are all set up. And yeah, basically this wraps up this whole section and I hope it will help you in building up your own USD workflow. Rim patterns are a great way to filter out parts of your scene in Solaris. You can add VEX into the Prim pattern. So one thing I want to show here, which is often requested and again, wasn't too obvious, is um, how to filter out per attributes. So I have here again two lights with LPE tags and down here I said, okay, I just want to edit the lights, all the lights, which LPE tag is sun. So in those curly brackets, you can check then, okay, USD is typed. That's a VEX function. And there I just search for lights and then I say end. That's from the brim pattern. And here I say S at karma colon light colon LPE tag equals sun. So that's again is VEX querying an attribute on the primitives it found. The same thing I did over here where I add a simple custom attribute called test and set it to foo. And here I change everything with this attribute and here I only change everything with this attribute of type cube. So that's a very uh, fast way to access data in your stage and precisely get what you want. The model API was something we added to our assets initially, but actually later realized how useful it is. Now, one of the things not immediately obvious is the model API only works properly when every prim in the hierarchy until the root prim actually has the kind specified. Otherwise, it will still show the kind in the scene graph tree, but things like draw mode or advanced filtering based on kind will not work as expected. Some notes on efficiency. Here's a good example on visibility versus activation. So if I make the prim invisible or if I deactivate it, it looks identical at first glance. But when we look at the scene graph and we say invisible, we see that the primitive and all its children are invisible now. And when we do activation, we see that the children are gone. What's happening here is that when we deactivate a primitive, this primitive is not loaded into memory. So this is a lot more efficient than just using visibility. That said, though, if you for what reason ever need to hide a primitive but still need access to the children, you, of course, need to use visibility. But other than that, activation is preferred since it's a lot more memory efficient and also the loading times are a lot faster when you deactivate stuff you don't need.
Another thing is that you do not need to save out every single frame as USD if you do not have animation in Solaris. Animation in Solaris means if you actually animated parameters. We, for example, got everything from animation and FX as USD already, and we did read in the USD file. We did not save the content of the USD file in the lighting layer. So this is one big advantage of being able to use layering because we can just save out one frame and the animation is still there because it comes from another layer. What we do here is that for getting the correct frame number into the output image, you have to use percent %04D instead of $F4 because $F4 will be evaluated and then you have a frame number hard-coded in the USD file. This is something you have to prevent by using percent %04D and then the render manager will simply pass on the frame number to Karma and Karma will then put in the frame number there, saving out one frame instead of the whole frame range. The default asset resolver that comes with USD supports a search path scheme that can be used to replace assets within a USD file to point to a different one. It can be very handy for versioning or testing. Besides the Pixar AR default search path environment variable, it is possible to modify the first path to look at with the configure stage lob. Here we have a reference with an absolute path and are now turning it into a search path by removing the first part of the path. And to load it in now properly, we will put that path into the resolver context asset path of a configure stage lob. Here it expects a path to actually a file, even though we will only be using the directory. So to make it look like a file, we simply add something like an underscore. This path is looked at before any path in the environment variable, so we can use it to dynamically update paths within the scene in Houdini, for example for testing or to change versions on the fly. What also has proven as a very good thing to debug USD scene in case you have a different result when you render it on the farm than when you render it locally is to use mPlay to render your scene. Since mPlay is not using the stage that Solaris builds up in memory, it's actually reading in uh, the USD files Solaris is using. So. That's a very good way to check if stuff is not reading incorrect due to misnaming of files or something, or if you have actually a problem in the scene itself. One thing to consider here, though, is that when you use layer muting, this does not work with mPlay. So muted layers are still loaded in when you use mPlay to render the scene. One thing we came across is the UVs in the Karma node. When you go into the image output, the UV section, uh, you have the UV checkbox here. And when you actually render this, you will kind of get an unexpected result, which looks like this. That is because this checkbox is actually rendering the prim UVs and not the actual UVs. If you want to render the actual UVs, you have to tell the UV to use the ST coordinates. And once you do that, you will get a desired result. One of the great things about Houdini is the access to daily builds. Especially with Solaris and Karma, we regularly saw a lot of new improvements and features that made a big difference for us. We found it therefore very useful to have an easy way to quickly install, test and then deploy new builds ready to be used in production. The changelog can also be a great way to discover new features that might not be noticed otherwise. USD with Solaris and Karma turned out to be a game changer for us and we are looking forward to using it more. I want to thank everyone involved for their effort and support dealing with such a novel workflow and also side effects for inviting us again. Axanima is always looking for talented people to join our team, so please don't hesitate to contact us.